Hey everyone, welcome to this podcast called Ken Reads, where I, Ken, read out your letter that you've shared with me in the hopes that I can better help you understand what the F just happened between you and the last partner you were dating, whether it was in a relationship or a situationship. I look at these experiences from the lens of attachment theory. I don't just come up with thought terminating cliches like they're just not that into you or if they wanted to, they would. While some of those phrases might have their benefit in other dynamics, I try and look at this from the lens of is there perhaps an insecure attachment issue that's at play in these particular dynamics? And though I am an Australian counsellor, I am not someone who is going to be responding to these letters as if I was with a client. I'm here to provide validation, yes, but I can't provide any diagnoses on these. So even if, you know, a lot of people might understandably hear this and be like, well, that sounds like a narcissist. At best, I'll probably say, sounds a bit narky. I probably won't go any further than that out of respect to my ethical boundaries in regards to what I can and can't do. If you find this of benefit to you, fantastic. That's what I want. And if you want to submit your letter, you're very welcome to once there is obviously availability per month. And I'll happily read out and share my own two cents as to what I think has gone on in your dating experience to offer you a sense of validation for what you've been through and also to give other people listening a chance to feel like maybe this relates to what they've also experienced as part of collective healing. So with that all out of the way, let's dive in to the latest letter. So before we dive into today's letter, I wanted to take the time to introduce a co-host to my letter reading. This will be the first time I've actually had a fellow colleague join me on Ken Reads. And so I'm pleased to introduce my coworker, Amy, to this podcast to share Amy's thoughts on what our letter writer, Charlie, has to say about the letter. But before we dive in, Amy, would you like to just uh, introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ken. I am so excited and happy to be here with you today. Uh, talking about my most favorite subject, attachment theory and relationships. Um, I am an attachment coach, a relationship coach. I specialize in anxious avoidant dynamics and particularly breakups. And I think that these are some of the most painful things that we experience. And there's so much healing to be had and there's so much helpful information. And I love nothing more than to discuss this with all of you. So here we go. Indeed, here we go. And just also for context to anyone listening, Amy is also part of my team taking on clients. So if you find Amy's insights particularly resonating and you like the vibe, feel free to check her out as per the links on my Instagram and also on this, um, not this podcast, but also on my website as well too. But with all the marketing out of the way, Let's dive straight in to what Charlie has to share with us. Now, Charlie's given us quite a comprehensive letter. So like I've done before, Amy and I will take moments to provide our commentary as we're going through this letter. So that way we can share some of our thoughts and feelings and also provide, you know, a bit of brevity as we're going through Charlie's narrative. So let's go straight into this. Firstly, Charlie writes, thank you for your fascinating and entertaining content. You're very welcome. It's been invaluable to my healing, including questioning why I had allow and try to return the, to the following situation. Okay, so this sounds already like it's boomerang avoidant territory. So Charlie states, I met her, my previous partner, over a dating app. On her first message, she enthusiastically asked me out on a date. Wow. At the time, I was elated. Now, when looking back, I'd be suspicious. I found her beautiful, intelligent, sexy, and funny. A bit aloof, mysterious, and had a way of telling me things she thought I'd want to hear. She projected power and confidence, although later on she'd confide her adaptive strategy to mask her insecurities and fears by going, quote-unquote, and this is going to sound a bit vulgar to listeners, so please bear this in mind. This is what's quoted in the letter. It's not me throwing this in. She says, to mask her insecurities and fears by going, quote unquote, tits out, as she called it. She was upfront early on about the enmeshment with her single mother, the abuse suffered from a relationship with a narcissist, 
and a string of emotionally unavailable partners and her role in attracting them. I discovered she had difficulty regulating her emotions and was prone to outbursts. She cried after we had sex for the first time, citing a fear I go back to my ex-wife. We had been separated for eight months and I assured her I had no intention of ever doing that. Feelings were intensifying for both of us after our best date yet. She broke up over text over worries I'd returned to my ex-wife. She didn't want to, quote, add to her trauma and admitted to breaking up with me before I could do the same to her. I have to take a pause here. Amy, what are your thoughts on this? Well, first off, Charlie, I just want to validate you and say, you know, this sounds like a very painful situation. Um, you know, any any back and forth and hot and cold with somebody who you really like is painful and it sort of creates this, this response in you that puts you on edge and creates a little bit of, you know, the beginning of perhaps some sort of trauma bond. Um, you know, I like that she seems self-aware enough to acknowledge her childhood enmeshment and her narcissistic mother. And right off the bat, you can know if you are meeting with someone who says they have that kind of history, they likely do have what is called a fearful avoidant attachment style. And this differs from dismissive avoidant attachment style in that fearful avoidance do usually come from a more chaotic upbringing. Um, it's a little bit messier. There are, you know, a little bit more severe traumas going on. And so it does sound like she's fearful avoidant. I would agree. And one thing I want to add to what you said too is, although I love her self-awareness, a bit trauma dumpy the way in which she launched into a lot of that past history with you. I wouldn't call that vulnerability in my opinion. I'd actually say she was giving you a play, you know, like basically she was giving you her past and basically expecting you to take care of her emotionally speaking. And we see that play out even with the way in which she's attempting and also did break up with you out of fears of you going back to an ex-wife. Like she is someone who is acting out her trauma very early on and it doesn't seem like she's taken any time to work on it. Yeah, absolutely. I agree, Ken. Um, you know, the breaking up out of nowhere, out of fear of this betrayal is something that we see so much with FA partners. Their biggest wound is that of trust and of betrayal. And so they will often break up with someone preemptively before they think that they are going to be left. And it will often be very jarring and shocking. And I also agree, while somebody acknowledging their trauma is self-aware, and that's always a good trait, when this sharing of these deep personal traumas happens so early on in the dating phase, it can definitely be a little bit of a pink or red flag, and it can definitely be categorized as trauma dumping, which is different from healthy vulnerability. Completely agree. And I think to distinguish, healthy vulnerability would be where you'd say things like, I feel like I'm having these insecurities around you returning to your ex, and I have these urges to break up with you that I don't want to act out on because I know that would be incredibly dysfunctional for both of us. I am taking the opportunity to tell you this to let you know what's going on inside of me. And it's my hope that by discussing this with you, I feel more at ease, or at the very least, you know, just to come up with a bit of a strategy for how to navigate this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, fearful avoidance often lack the ability to remain emotionally regulated during a time where they're having these fears and telling someone about their fears in a healthy way and saying something to the effect of what you just recited takes emotional regulation. It takes healthy communication skills and it takes vulnerability, true vulnerability. And those are things that unfortunately fearful avoidance and actually all of the insecure attachment styles really struggle with. So it is not uncommon for somebody to be broken up with. And this decision is sort of a unilateral decision where, you know, Charlie, unfortunately, it doesn't sound like you had much say. And she just decided, this is what I'm afraid of. And I'm gone. 
Yep. And it's not healthy in a light, like in a least. And I think what I will say what's alarming to me is how quickly this happened into your relationship where she's spelling out, well, I did this to you, so you wouldn't do this to me. Normally, in my experience with people who are even severely fearful avoidant, whether it be dismissive or anxious leaning, it doesn't happen quite like this this early on. And I gotta say, this to me seems like it's coming out more from an anxious attached side of her fearful avoidance, not the dismissive side. I could be wrong, but it does feel a bit more on the anxious side than the dismissive side at this point. What are your thoughts on that, Amy? Oh, can I absolutely agree? And I'm so glad that you brought that up because you're so right. It's not often that we see this sort of bolting this early on in the relationship. And I completely agree that this is probably indicative of a severely, a severe fearful avoidant attachment and absolutely, at least at this point, leaning very anxious. Correct. So let's get back into what Charlie has to say. <clears throat> he continues, we reconcile a month later and things quickly escalated into a full relationship. He adds, yeah, I know. And we almost broke up again on first vacation over something minor. She was freaking out. I stayed calm and we seemed to work through it, although she later admitted to going through my wallet while I was in the shower, although she couldn't explain why. Another hot cycle. She said no one had ever loved and cared for her like me. I'm just going to say now that is even though it's wonderful to hear that, that is such an avoidant line. And it's something that's quite cliche at this particular point in time. So glad for her that she, you've obviously had this impact on her because she likely means what, you know, she's saying. But it's also, unfortunately, when I look back on this, a bit of a red flag. But anyways, let's continue. We discussed combining families as we were both single parents, moving in together, a European vacation, discussing marriage, loving feelings, talk was frequent. We started and encouraged, which was all started and encouraged by her. We discussed attachment styles and she admitted she's a fearful avoidant, but I thought, well, I'm in love and I can guide us through the tough times. Oh, Charlie. She had me over to her place for the first time, eight months after our first date. Three weeks prior to a breakup, the end of the honeymoon period, she started to pull away and fault finding and there was less communication and there was also conflict provoking from her side. I asked for her to try I feel statements, something which I practice, and she gave a non-answer as she doesn't like psychology talk unless she was the one using it herself. Mm. I was accused of bringing up quote-unquote unimportant things while trying to discuss my feelings and the relationship. When I'd seek support with work or family issues, she discussed my issues as if to prove they were non-problems. I'm guessing something she learned from her mother. On a dinner to celebrate my new job, she didn't even mention the new job, but thereafter would encourage me, unsolicited, to seek a trendier career like hers. Okay, that's not okay. She'd frequently bring up her phantom ex, but usually in a negative light. Although this time, she brought him up in a positive one while still in bed with me after sex. Mm. <laughs> Nevertheless, things moved forward as she introduced me to her daughter, a big set. It seemed to go very well. Frustration bubbles up into an argument and mid-argument she felt what she later described as a light switch flip and she lost all feelings. Later on in that conversation, unaware of what happened and assuming we worked past the issue, I felt gaslit when I asked for clarification on long-term goals. Now limited to quote unquote being together but living in separate residences. What happened to moving in together? She referred to the feelings talk as something I had started and quote unquote cued at first. Multiple past events distorted in an instant, and she seemed to believe it completely too. At the time, I was dumbfounded. The next few days were great, and we seemed back on track with frequent communication and event planning for the upcoming holidays. On the fourth day, she admitted she was just going through the motions and lost all feelings when the internal flip switched, which she blamed on me. I was numb and devastated. She asked for a breakup citing incompatible fighting styles and asked in a state of agony why I couldn't be more emotional when we had our big vacation fight. Mm. She also projected that I didn't trust her. When I asked how everything can change in a span of a week, she simply shrugged her shoulders. I could tell she'd been here before. She sadly said, I was a catch. And that was that. Okay. Amy, before I let you launch into this, I just want to say <laughs> um, hello to the avoidance side of this lady. Like, I really feel like 
this is the avoidance side coming out now. Absolutely. Hello, avoidance side. And, you know, and, and this really is fearful avoidant attachment style at its best. As you can see, she is displaying both anxious wounds and avoidant wounds. She is displaying both anxious behaviors and avoidant behaviors. And again, Charlie, we are here, we are holding your hand, and we are so sorry that you went through this because this sounds like a roller coaster, which again, not to sound like a broken record, is par for the course with any relationship with a fearful avoidant. You will notice this theme of consistent inconsistency, consistent, hot, and cold. And again, you know, for our listeners, because, you know, most of you guys are dealing with really painful things with avoidance and fearful avoidance. Another big difference between the fearful avoidant and the dismissive avoidant is fearful avoidance, as you can see, Charlie, uh, they push away and they push hard. You know, imagine someone shoving you away with all of their might, and it can be out of nowhere. Dismissive avoidance will not push you hard. They will kind of just slowly back away and fade into the trees. Um, and, and nonetheless, you know, both are extremely painful. And it sounds like she definitely put you through a lot here. Um, and there's just so much here to discuss. Um, you know, the, the searching through your wallet while on vacation, again, it, it's so in theme with this huge betrayal trust wound. Um, it's like she is searching desperately for something to say, aha, gotcha. I knew I couldn't trust you. And you can see that this is coming out in all of her behaviors. Um, you know, I also have to say, I really don't like that she was invalidating your job while at dinner. Um, to me, that is very manipulative. And I know it is probably coming from a place of wounding. This sounds like a dismissive avoidant or more avoidant coping mechanism, which is called flaw finding or fault finding. And what is happening here likely is that her feelings are intensifying. And a lot of this fault finding usually happens on the heels of plans, future plans, either moving in together or engagements or vacations. This fear of closeness and vulnerability it, it, it triggers this fear inside of the avoidant and it makes them start to find things wrong with the person, things that they might not have ever noticed before and things that are really incons inconsequential, but they zoom in on these things. And in this case, it sounds like she was trying to pick on your job as just a way to gain some more distance. And, you know, it's really unfair. Um, and there's nothing wrong with whatever job you have, I promise you. Another, in a, another, you know, tactic or strategy I see here, which is extremely common with fearful avoidance, is that she did not appreciate the psychology talk when you try to healthfully bring up matters in the relationship. You were using I statements. I'm sure you were approaching this in a kind and calm and curious way. And that is amazing. That's always what we want to do in relationships, approach with kindness, compassion, and curiosity. And when you are met with her saying, I don't want to deal with this psychology talk, and you notice that she only doesn't want to deal with it when it's aimed at her, mm -hmm. that to me is a huge defense mechanism. And unfortunately, it is manipulative. Do I think it was intentionally manipulative? Probably not. But that is her sort of fear response coming out. And I think what that is, is Basically, and I say this lovingly, having an FA history myself, she does not want to be held accountable for these very obvious, unhealthy behaviors that she's expressing in this relationship. What do you think, Ken? I completely agree. And I want to actually compliment what you just said there. I do find it deeply ironic that she was all about telling you the psychology of her history, her narcissistic mother, the enmeshed relationship she had with her, how she's a fearful avoidant when it was on her terms. But the minute you decide to talk about this, I don't wanna discuss this psychology talk. It's like, oh, so you get to have your cake and eat it too, but you, Charlie, aren't even allowed to go there? Not okay. This is very hypocritical behavior. And I also think too, it's interesting how she was the one to initiate the conversations around feelings, emotions. It's very much, you know, she's controlling, not by intention, I think, but more out of fear, the intensity of the relationship. And I will say, 
you know, it's interesting how, as Amy, what you were saying, as the intensity deepened, and I think that fear of abandonment piece was starting to subside because it couldn't find any evidence of anything going wrong. It's almost like that's when things started to shift into the more avoidant side of like fear of intimacy. And it's almost like another layer of stuff came up from her where it was more walls going up, becoming cold, distant, removed. And this is so consistent in a lot of people who are severely fearful avoidant where you're often dealing with a very erratic, jarring, fear of abandonment piece. And once you've proven to the person who's fearful avoidant that you're not going anywhere and that sort of like looking for evidence to see like where the betrayal's coming has suddenly gone away, that's when that next layer, that part of them comes out to try and push away because they have, even though in the beginning, they say they love the emotional talks. They're all about the psychology. They're not really. You see, the thing is, is that for a lot of severe fearful avoidance, they do not like feeling their feelings. They think vulnerability is weakness. And even being able to express stuff, which they said to you in the beginning was the way they like being communicated, they really don't like it themselves. You gotta to remember too, she had a, according to her, she had a narcissistic mum. Chances are she survived by being very tough as nails and not having to deal with emotions, probably because any time that was a theme that came up, it was too hard for her. So the fact that you've actually gotten to this level with her suggests you actually got quite deep. And it sounds like the way she was loving you is probably just the way her mum was loving her. So you're getting that side of it. Oh my gosh, Ken, absolutely. And that's something that we always have to remember when we're in these painful experiences. You know, the way that we show up in our adult romantic relationships is going to be such a mirror of the way that we were loved in childhood, just like you said. And, you know, unfortunately, coming from a background that included enmeshment and, you know, a narcissistic parent, that is very chaotic. And, you know, we're, we're speaking so much about the fearful avoidant wounds and the anxious and dismissive wounds. And just for everyone listening, you know, the importance of these wounds is that these are basically our main fears. And so much of our behavior and the way we deal with adult romantic relationships is going to be driven by these fears until we do healing work. And it sounds like for whatever reason, she was not at this time in this relationship with you, Charlie, willing, ready, or able to do that work. And so what you are seeing is an expression of the chaos in her mind around what love is and if she can trust love. And so we talked about earlier that one of the main fearful avoidant wounds that is very present here in what's happening is this fear of betrayal. Now, what we're seeing in this later part of the letter is the expression of the second biggest fearful avoidant wound, which is this fear of being trapped. Now, you might be thinking, Charlie, how can she feel trapped? I'm telling her that I love her. We're making these plans. This is beautiful. We have this amazing connection and this amazing love. Well, when you are a person who grew up with the experience and messaging that, yes, love feels good sometimes, but it can't be trusted and it also feels really bad sometimes and it's unsafe, the way a lot of fearful avoidance in childhood cope is by leaving whenever they want closing themselves off and having a lot of independence so that even though they might be in chaos that they can't escape a lot of the time, they can escape sometimes. And their self-sufficiency is something that keeps them safe. And so when we're in an adult relationship and we're being loved in this healthy way, the thought of putting our guard down is so scary and that fear of being trapped, even if it's by healthy love, comes up and it really sounds like that might be what is at play here in the latter part of your letter that we were just reading through. I agree. And I think that before I go on to the last part of this letter, you know, to me, it's it's interesting because I think deep down she absolutely does want love, but I think that subconsciously she can't handle it. Like I just think that that defensiveness for self-sufficiency and also freedom, I think is preventing her from having the very thing she probably wanted with you. And I think it's really sad because I wouldn't be surprised if this very egotistical part of her is now like, I don't need this. He was the problem. Charlie was the issue. He did all of this to me. 
it's all fault finding for the sake of keeping her feeling psychologically safe yet emotionally disconnected and so this is someone who until they get healed frankly is going to continue behaving like this with future partners as well too and it's sad because she's probably more look I say this not out of, you know, condemnation to her, but more just it's how it usually goes. She's actually probably more suited to a lover who treats her like her mum. She's probably more used to someone who reminds her of that feeling of probably being enmeshed, of someone who, you know, doesn't treat her well. She even said to you, I wish you were more emotional when we had our first fight when we were on holidays. That, to me, screams... I wanted more of that intensity I'm familiar with from someone who may be more chaotic and dysfunctional. Maybe it's for her, she thinks, oh, well, if you fought more for this, it would mean that you wanted me. Maybe she equates fighting with love, which, you know, leans a bit more on the anxious side of things too. Who knows? But speculation aside, the point simply is to say is that, yet yeah, she's definitely uh, not behaving like a functional partner. Absolutely, Ken. And I'll just say one more thing, um, you know, about the part where she said, why can't you be more emotional when we fight? You know, that's also something that is kind of very exclusively fearful avoidant. You won't ever see a dismissive avoidant encouraging big emotions, whether good or bad. So oh, no. that is a very fearful avoidant thing. And again, you know, like you were just saying, Ken, it is really sad and it is so tragic. And I actually do think that it is sort of the tragedy that all insecure attachment styles suffer is that we all want love. We are all wired for love and attachment and connection. But until we start doing the healing work, we will absolutely self-sabotage and go back to our subconscious comfort zone. And Ken and I will do another episode all about that more in detail in the future. But basically, the subconscious comfort zone means what we were talking about earlier, it is reminiscent. It is the flavor of what love was, what connection was in childhood and in adult romantic relationships until you heal, even though your childhood might have been painful and chaotic. If you are in a healthy, stable relationship as an adult, that won't feel good. It won't feel safe because it's not familiar. What's familiar is chaos. And like you said, Ken, unfortunately, and we've seen this so many times, fearful avoidance will be in this amazing, healthy relationship with a stable, emotionally safe and loving partner and end up sabotaging, leaving and going to be with somebody who's toxic, not because that's what they consciously want, but because that is what is familiar and what is therefore comfortable for them. And that is absolutely very sad. Yeah, it is. But it also, you know, the other comfort in doing that is it makes her out to be, I'm not the bad person. I'm dating someone who's toxic and dysfunctional. No need for accountability on my part. I just date all these weirdos and narcissists. It's like, no, you choose them because it's psychologically safe. And the thing is, deep down, a lot of these people know what they're doing as well, too. So a burden they will carry to their grave unless they decide to work on it, but it's bloody hard to do that. Anyways, let's round out the last piece of what Charlie has to say. So post breakup, he adds, we met, we made plans to meet up and discuss reconciliation, but she was cold, even angry when I contacted her to confirm it was happening. After five months of no contact, I, sorry, after five months of no contact, I texted her out of curiosity. We attempted a friendship. And yes, I did want her in my life, but the ultimate goal was reconciliation. If she'd seek therapy, which I admittedly was not upfront about, it otherwise it just seemed one-sided as if I just provided support and validation and she'd communicate sporadically, seemingly on a whim, sometimes flirtatiously. She'd bring up a new rationalization for our breakup, unprompted, as if to remind herself why we weren't meant to be together. I suspected she'd forgotten the initial reasons. She also forgot about the trip we had been planning together at the time of breakup, asking me why I had taken a solo vacation and why that destination. In-person hangouts were a confusing mix of intense flirting, including physical contact for hours, while openly discussing her new friends with benefits way too openly, and even texting him a live cleavage pic while seated next to me. At the very same spot we had our first date, it was just too much, too confusing, too painful. It was clear she enjoyed the validation of me chasing, yes, but she had no intention of ever following through. Hell yeah. 
A refreshing moment of honesty arrived as she admitted to asking herself why she no longer wants me, but she has no answers, but it's something beyond her control. Painful to hear, but also a liberating one. I could no longer pretend this wasn't a trauma bond. I worried I'd be further enabling her unless I shared two things. One, how much her actions had hurt me, and two, describe to her how her attachment style impacted our relationship. I didn't think this, whatever this dynamic was, would survive this, but I'd hoped her hearing both points could be a catalyst for change in the long term. Predictably, it was met with defensiveness, and she asked if I preferred if she had handled breakup as her ex had broken up with her, also a fearful avoidant. Aha, uh -huh, there's the chaos, and described a classic avoidant slow fade. I replied, both styles of breakup were traumatic and different sides of the same coin, to which she replied with a block on all platforms. Wow. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's appalling. So it seems like she couldn't handle the fact that she'd been a bad person in this relationship and she probably couldn't handle the shame. Amy, what are your thoughts on all this? Oh, my goodness. Charlie, I'm sorry. I really am. You know, this is this is loud on fire fearful avoidant behavior um you know it, it's it's a lot of insult to injury happening here um you know just to go back a bit uh this this whole notion of you know she seems to really have been provoking you to fight for her kind of in an endless way even though it also seems at the same time that she didn't really have an intention of staying with you and this is really, really painful and unfortunate behavior. And again, I'm so sorry that you experienced this. Um, testing. Testing is something that fearful avoidance do all the time. And again, it is mo motivated by this, this drive to figure people out and, and uncover them. And finally, you know, have a gotcha moment. And, you know, she wants you to fight for her and express this, this love and maybe even fight with her because that means love you know that chaos is love and that feels good and i just want to commend you for not giving in and not you know allowing the cycle to perpetuate because if you enter into this cycle as you might have experienced the longer you stay in it and the longer you play this game the harder it is to get out and the more and more you lose your sense of self because participating in this cycle it really wears you down and it actually creates this sort of feeling of an addiction in your brain with this constant hot and cold intermittent reinforcement so a lot of these things are going on you know I will say it, these behaviors from the insecure attachment styles although I do believe that these behaviors are coming from a place of wounding and most people aren't trying to be emotionally abusive. Sometimes that's what it can be. And, and we can feel emotionally abused. That can be our experience of it. Um, so, you know, I really don't like what I hear here, especially the part where she is talking about her exes and, and sending a picture of, to them while she's with you. That is just really unhealthy, manipulative bad behavior. I mean, that is not even something that I would say the typical fearful avoidant would do. That's definitely something a more severe FA would do. And, you know, it's unacceptable. We can have empathy for people's wounds. And at the same time, we do not have to accept and approve of their behavior. I will add to what Amy said too on the severe note, which is to say, listen, if any of you listening to this were like BPD, NPD, it sounds like narcissism. You're very welcome to use that because, you know, there is definitely overlap with insecure attachments and all those, you know, more maladaptive styles of relating and also um, the cluster B personalities, which is not to say everybody with a BPD, you know, diagnosis behaves this way. They certainly don't. There's lots of subcategories for people who have that. I may not have the power to say absolutely she's a narcissist or she has BPD, but what I am here to say is there's definitely possibility of overlap here, which I don't think can be completely ignored. But at the very least, if we look at this exclusively from exclusively from the lens of attachment theory, mega, 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 mega fearful avoidance sort of behavior going on here. And to circle back to what Amy was saying with the whole her showing her cleavage to her friends with benefits while you were there, I interpret that as 
She wanted to get attention from you, Charlie. I think she wanted you to fight for her to get some reassurance, even though it seemed like she was putting walls up in that moment. And I think she would probably deny that she was ever doing that in the first place. But deep down, we've got to remember, this is someone who's behaving like an external validation junkie. She wants someone to crave for her, to fight for her, and to make her feel good about herself. Were she a dismissive avoidant, you wouldn't be getting any of this sort of behavior at all. In fact, the last thing you'd be getting is even a reconciliation opportunity at all, because usually dismissive avoidants are like, no thanks. Some do, but not with this kind of behavior attached. Like this is not something we would typically see with dismissives. But um, I wanted to quickly quick fire the questions that you've left for us, Charlie, because We've got some time before we need to wrap up. So I feel like we've answered two of these. You ask, is it standard for fearful avoidance to not respond well to psychology terms and healthy communication, such as I statements, yet use psychology terms themselves? I feel we answered that and said, I think that's more of a case of it was all on her terms. And even though she's very aware, she didn't want to use that against herself because she doesn't like being held accountable because of some poor wounds inside of her. Amy, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm so glad that you asked this question, Charlie, because it's actually really interesting. You know, generally, fearful avoidance actually love psychology talk, and they love, you know, personal development and growth, and they love having these, these you know, deep conversations, again, because it gives them more information about the person and helps them keep the upper hand. If they know a lot about you and your psychology, they feel safer because they can maintain the upper hand in the relationship and have more control and therefore are less vulnerable. And it's interesting because a lot of the times, you know, fearful avoidance will absolutely dive in and try to psychoanalyze you and get every single bit of your information about your childhood and trauma and past relationships. And then when that microscope is turned on them, they do not like it. And they will sort of back away, um, you know, uh, not usually to this severe degree that she did. But to answer your question, yes, this this is definitely, I think, something that fearful avoidance absolutely do. They They, on the surface, look like they like vulnerability, but they really like it from you, not so much, you know, to give it from their end. Yep. I completely agree. I'm going to do two more questions before we need to round out. Um, we've got here, I interpret her incompatible fighting styles rationalization as a fearful avoidant being bored or unnerved by someone who has secure tendencies, at least when it comes to relationship work and disputes. Are these two attachment styles simply incompatible? In your case, I think absolutely yes. And I think it's more because I don't think it's because those two can't make it work. It's because she didn't want to make it work. What are your thoughts on that, Amy? Absolutely. You know, people often say, which attachment styles are most compatible or incompatible? And while sometimes there is, you know, evidence to show that fearful avoidance are often most with dismissive avoidance or secure people, any two attachment styles can absolutely make it work. The only ingredient that is needed is a willingness and an ability and a decision to do so on both parts. And usually one party is less willing because of fears. So the only ingredient needed from any attachment style is kind of the ingredient of courage and vulnerability to say, we've got some stuff, I've got some issues, I've got some fears, but I'm willing to work on these things and heal because I want to work on this relationship together. Absent that, it can't work. But with that, I really do think anything can work. Agreed. And then we've got one more question here, which is, will my discussing her attachment style about her being a fearful avoidant have any long-term impact for her improving herself? Or was I just misguided and naive? I don't think there's anything wrong with bringing it up, but I don't think she's shown based on this experience to want to work on it. So not to say you're naive, but I think it's more of a case of not everyone's going to want to change. And to be completely honest, I think this partner's in the category of, I think she likes talking about attachment theory for her own benefit to feel like she's got some control over a dynamic, but I don't think she's looking to take that next step to work on herself yet. Yeah, absolutely. I agree, Ken. You know, I think attachment theory is an amazing tool that people can use to really heal their wounds and have healthier, happier relationships. But again, that ingredient of 
having made that decision and saying, I'm going to open this door. I'm going to walk down this healing path, even though it's going to be scary and hard, people have to make that decision. And the thing is, Charlie, and I want you to know this, if you take anything away, I hope you take a lot away from this, but definitely take away the fact that she does not seem willing to work on her attachment stuff for you and for the relationship is absolutely no reflection on you or your worth. People have to come to that decision to heal their attachment stuff or any of their stuff on their own. So to answer your question more straightforwardly, you know, is this a waste of time to bring this up? Um, in this case, I don't think that it will really make a difference because she seems to already know she has this attachment style and she seems for whatever reason to not be quite ready to work on it. Completely agree. Now, just rounding out here, Amy, thank you for joining us. Charlie, thank you for the letter. If anyone has listened to this and has really been keen to submit their letter, please know we'll accept submissions next month when we reopen them. Other than that, Amy and I will rejoin at another point for future letter reading, and we look forward to seeing you then. So thank you very much, everybody. Mm -hmm.